Before we begin, I want to mention a couple of things. Number one, please play this game right now if you haven't played it before. Don't need to watch my review or anything, just goddamn download the game and play it. I guarantee you, you will have a great time with it and you will miss out on a lot if you decide otherwise. Link in the description. Just wanted to say that before you click off the video. Number two, the footage on screen is not the actual gameplay that I'm basing this video on. The actual gameplay has a lot more resolution and runs with 60 plus FPS. I managed to screw up the recording settings for some of the on-screen footage. So for those footage, it will look like I played this game on OG Resident Evil 2 resolution. Also, I'll be using cheats and some mods for the on-screen footage. Alright, onto the video. Immersive Sims A genre that is super niche but somehow always has a really good roster of video games. Bioshock, Dishonored, System Shock, Thief, Vampire, The Masquerade, Bloodlines, and Deus Ex are some of them. Among them, I would say Deus Ex is one of the earliest considering its ties with the Thief franchise and Warren Spector. It's important for me to give you the general outline of the story behind it in order to show you why this game matters and why I insisted that you play this game in the disclaimer. It began when Warren Spector played Thief while working with Looking Glass Studios, uh, the studio behind the Thief franchise. Thief is a series that is well known for its hardcore stealth and things of that like. Warren Spector found this style of gameplay too restrictive and wanted to be able to brute force his way out of some of the sticky situations. And that's one of the major foundations that led to Deus Ex. So, what came out of this foundation? What came out of Deus Ex? Well, it resulted in something that was very new for the time. The gameplay was very liberal. You can go guns blazing or complete stealth. Player's choice was emphasized like never before. While the game is initially hard to get into, with its opening level not being the most representative of the game, most of the game is just a player left to their desires. Now that I have described the basic outline of the game, you might think he just described every other open world RPGs out there. And that is why you have to remember that this game is old. So old that you are not alive. So old that people who played this game then are now into their 30s. Not only is it that, but also the fact that that very statement shows how influential this game was while not being that renowned. Most of the new games on the market that you can think of borrow so much from this game. The stealth route or the combat route is in every Ubisoft game and all of the PS4 exclusive open world titles. Now you can see why I emphasized that you at least play this game rather than watch through my whole video. So, let's start talking about the game. Now, you might think, from all that I have described about the game, this game is going to be over thousands of hours with so much to see and do that you will be sitting on this game for the next 5 years of your life. Well, not exactly. Contrary to what is said before, this experience is very compact. Instead of players creating their own story and forging their own experience, this game is more like bending the game's narrative to your will. This game is more like a cousin to the modern open world RPGs than their ancestors. The game features a narrative that includes things like secret government agencies, super secret spies, conspiracies and things of that element. Since we got this far into the video, I might as well address the title of this video which is I can't review this. I title this mainly because this game is so many levels deep for me to review. If I were to play through it all and then make a review, I'll basically be spending my eternity making this video and you'll spend your eternity watching my crappy review. So instead, I figured I might as well just talk about it and convince you to play it. Also the fact that the titles click me. Anyways, let's talk about the setting. It's 2052. You play as JC Denton, a new recruit agent to the new United Nations branch called Unatco. UNATCO was formed as a stand against the growing threat of terrorism, mainly in the US. The National Secessionist Force, or the NSF, has stolen a bunch of ambrosia, an important medical agent that helps people fight against the ever-growing disease called the Great Death, which has spread all over the world. 
Damn, that sucks. It's not like we have anything like this happening in real life. Thousands of people are definitely not dying and stuff. What do you mean there is a dangerous resemblance here? Shut up! Anyways, your first assignment is to investigate and locate the containers of Ambrosia that the NSF has stolen. The story spirals into a very interesting and somewhat mind-boggling narrative from there on. In terms of gameplay, it's classic immersive sense. You have a form of inventory management that incentivizes you to plan out your method of playstyle. You come across various tools that helps you navigate obstacles the levels give you. You can take the combat route or the stealth route, but a playstyle that mixes both is preferable. I mean, you can go the combat route completely with the various guns and stuff, but the game has a skill point system. If your skills are not high enough in the combat field, then your aiming might as well be the same as shooting with a blindfold on. How about completely going ghost and masking your presence then? Well, you're not going to have a fun time because not only will you miss a whole lot of very appealing content, but also the fact that the enemy AI is not exactly consistent. Some bits of gameplay is just underdeveloped like dropping boxes making sounds, dropping items making sounds, knocking out an enemy while in proximity of another enemy, etc. I mean, there is a whole feature of you being able to pick up bodies and move them. So you would assume enemies would notice their fellow dead comrades bodies lying on the floor and investigate them. And to the game's credit, it is there, but that only happened once during my entire three playthroughs of this game. Due to inconsistencies like this, while you can stealth it completely due to the fact that there is a quick save and quick load function making the gameplay experimental, it's not that enjoyable. Since I mentioned the skill system, I guess I might as well talk about that next. This game has like three of these systems, namely the augmentation system, augmentation upgrade system and the skill system. The skill system is straightforward. You have a bunch of skills like electronics, hacking, athletics, lock picking, etc. You can upgrade each of these skills by exploring places and doing other unspecific things and earning skill points. Upon upgrading, you can improve things like being able to breathe more underwater, being more accurate with guns, and being efficient in lock picking and with hacking resources. You have four states for each skill. They are untrained, trained, advanced, and master. The way this game is designed, you can either concentrate much on one skill or spread it evenly across each of the skills. I like this system very much as it fits into the whole thing of being liberal with its gameplay. Then we have the augmentation system. So one detail that I essentially forgot to add is that JC Denton is kind of a cyborg. He has augmentations that helps him become super strong, run very fast or become invisible and stuff. The augmentation system is exactly that. Basically you start out with three augmentations. The infolink which helps with remote communications, the IFF which is basically the HUD and a flashlight augmentation. The first two are basically there to explain how JC Denton can see the things the way he sees. You have a bunch more augmentations that you can find in levels by the means of augmentation canisters. Each of them contains two augmentations from which you can select one. The augmentations are installed through medbots which is the robot that heals you. Finally, we have the augmentation upgrade system. This is basically an upgrade system for your augmentations. You can find augmentation upgrade canisters and levels which will upgrade the various augmentations you have installed. You can do this directly from your inventory. The other thing of note is this game does not have a map system. Now this was kind of a hot topic within the Deus Ex community when one of the subsequent games, uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution had a map system which showed enemy locations and other things of note. Personally I don't care whether the game has a map or not, I'm of the opinion that the whole argument of having no map equals more immersion is a bit pretentious. I don't know exactly why I say pretentious, but it gives that feelings, those feelings to me. Yes, it's a whole thing of taking your eyes off the world and into the heart ruins immersion bit of argument that leads me to say so. I mean, like, come on, does it matter that much that a few seconds of not looking at the world that much of a bother to you? I don't know. Whatever. I prefer that most games have a map than have no map, 
Why I say this is because if having no map becomes the standard, then good games that might have terrible language of map navigation slash level navigation, it would essentially be a pain to play which could otherwise have been avoided with a map system. I don't know, take that as two cents from me to that whole conversation. At the end of the day though, the gameplay is not like the best thing of this game. One way to put it would be to say that this game does not have a proper structure in terms of gameplay. The combat is very jank, uh, especially on lower skill levels. The stealth can be inconsistent and unreliable. Does not matter if you take the non-lethal route or the lethal route, the gameplay being not that great is literally addressed by the game by giving you a one-shot kill weapon halfway through the game, essentially hoping that the player is intrinsically motivated to make the combat more interesting. And to be fair, I did. I don't know if it's a me thing, but I did find myself relying less on that weapon due to the single fact that it makes most encounters very dull. Again, the experimental gameplay style this game has had some contribution to that since I found most encounters as experiments rather than encounters. Since I talked about combat encounters, I might as well talk about the game's difficulties. This game has four difficulties, namely easy, medium, hard and realistic. I've tried all of them except realistic. Um, the main difference between them is that you take more damage the higher the difficulty. In reality though, the difficulty does not matter for a first playthrough as even on hard, I found myself still able to take a lot of damage as you can see on the on screen footage. Since I did not try the realistic difficulty, I did take a look at the Deus Ex wiki and it says that the realistic difficulty also does not change much other than enemy damage. Before I talk about the next bit, I want to talk about the training level. Now, when people talk about the intro level to the game, they usually refer to the first main mission in the main game. This level is well known to be a poor representation of how the game plays. But what people fail to mention is that there is a whole training mission which introduces you to the, most of the main mechanics of the game. It also introduces you to some of the story elements in the game. While this level also does not represent the main game, it does a much better job on how to play the game. Personally jumped into this first and it successfully made me familiar with how the game plays. But then again, I had experience with Deus Ex Human Revolution, so maybe I knew what I was running into. Now let's talk about the graphics. The graphics are not the best even in terms of the year 2000. For context, this was the time when games like Hitman, Codename 47, Counter-Strike, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Jet Grind Radio, Tony Hawk Pro Skaters 2, etc. came out. Compared to those games, this game has a very low polygon count. Almost all male models look like JC Denton. The textures look like they have been compressed to infinity. I could go on and on, but I won't exactly hold it onto the game because I could not care about them after the second mission. But that might be due to the f fact that I could not care about graphics, except for their initial presentation for games, just in general. Now, I did not play the game vanilla, in fact, I only played the GMDX mod of this game since that was recommended online for some of the quality of life improvements it gives or the vanilla version. But beware of the revision mod though, as I heard that it changes way too much for a first time playthrough. Now, if the GMDX mod is not enough for you even after a few hours into the game, then I would say try the Helios overhaul mod. Though I would heavily advise against this for a first time playthrough as it did change some bits of gameplay for me by giving a sprint exhaustion system and mechanics of a necessary kind. So in short, the graphics are fine for the game as it never was the thing for the game. Play your first playthrough either vanilla or with the GMDX mod and for a second playthrough try the Helios mod to keep you interested visually. Trust me, you definitely want to do a second playthrough. Now let's talk about the story. I won't talk about the actual story since I want you to find that out yourself. Instead, I will be talking about what the story leaves and what it intended. Okay, with that said, let's talk about the story. 
The story begins with this amazing masterpiece of a cutscene. Your appointment to FEMA should be finalized within the week. I've already discussed the matter with the Senator. I take it he was agreeable? He didn't really have a choice. Has he been infected? Oh yes, most certainly. When I mentioned that we could put him on the priority list for the Ambrosia vaccine, he was so willing it was almost pathetic. This play, the rioting, is intensifying to the point where we may not be able to contain it. Why contain it? Let it spill over into the schools and churches. Let the bodies pile up in the streets. In the end, they'll beg us to save them. I've received reports of armed attacks on shipments. There's not enough vaccine to go around, and the underclasses are starting to get desperate. Of course they're desperate. They can smell their death, and the sound they'll make rattling their cage will serve as a warning to the rest. Hmm. I hope you're not underestimating the problem. The others may not go as quietly as you think. Intelligence indicates they're behind the problems in Paris. A bunch of pretentious old men playing at running the world. But the world left them behind long ago. We are the future. We have other problems. UNATCO? Formed by executive order after the terrorist strike on the statue. I have someone in place, though. I'm more concerned about Savage. He relocated to Vandenberg. Our biochem corpus is far in advance of theirs, as is our electronic sentience. And their ethical inflexibility has allowed us to make progress in areas they refuse to consider. The Augmentation Project? Among other things, but I must admit that I have been somewhat disappointed in the performance of the primary unit. The secondary unit should be online soon. It's currently undergoing preparation and will be operational within six months. My people will continue to report on its progress. Necessary, the primary will be terminated. We've had to endure much, you and I, but soon there will be order again. A new age. Aquinas spoke of the mythical city on the hill. Soon that city will be a reality, and we will be crowned its kings. Not better than kings. Gods. Yeah, Naughty Dog could never dream of a cinematic experience like this. Okay, jokes aside though, I feel like this could have been done in a different way. The way this plays out on the player's first playthrough, the cinematic gives them a feeling of something is not right, so they're revealing too much, even though it reveals too much. That is because the player does not know anything about the game, and while the game informs the player of some basic key plot elements like the two dudes doing the dialogue is probably evil, uh, and there is some sort of sickness and everything in this world has turned for the horrible, the more detailed elements is not understandable to the player due to the player not knowing the importance of the, those details. While this might be genius, you end up knowing about the big bad of the game before even having stakes to care about it, hence totally missing the point of the said big bad. So instead, I'm curious to see what would have been if the game introduced the big bad of the game as the game progressed. I don't know, sound interesting. Alright, now let's talk about what I really want to talk about. The story relevance. This game is obviously set in the future, specifically 2052. With that setting, this game has its own takes and statements about the future. Now, while not all of it is accurate, some of what it said is oddly specific and kinda intriguing. I mean things like global pandemic, specifically that of a bacteria slash virus, or statements of rich people on taxes and that of individuals having too much power, etc. is kinda bizarre. This is not to say whatever the game says about them and what they are is true, but what I loved about the game is that the story deals with elements that are kinda relevant to our times. I enjoyed the various spins it put on those elements. Now, mind you though, the future presents and the future you're going to play is what people in the 1990s and 2000s thought what the future would have been like than what we usually think nowadays. In terms of aging, this game is mostly like fine wine, I guess. I mean, this game obviously goes for a semi-serious tone and the elements that I mentioned about being surprisingly relevant means that it worked hugely in favor of the game. You see, if you're going to make a serious game that is going to be dealing with somewhat serious plot elements, then it 
better be relevant to that setting. Allow me to give you a picture. Imagine if the game made statements like everyone is going to be rich in the future, humanity discovers immortality, global depression rates becomes non-existent, and poverty is going to be a thing of the past. Then the player playing the game would start laughing at the game like it was a comedic game than a serious game, thereby cancelling all the serious elements and stakes the game has to offer. This is not to say that you cannot do otherwise and not get a good game out of it, but this is to highlight the fact that this game has stood the test of time for an impressive amount of time. Sure, it might be 2021 now and the game is set in 2052, but is that really the point? I mean, if anything, I'm curious what will be of the future and give me something to look forward to every day. Okay, now, should I have said this before and discuss what I have discussed so far? But if you have not realized this by now, this game relies heavily on controversy. It deals with the fun parts of controversy, you know, of discovering secrets and putting together dots and all that goodies. Well, that is not wanna, what I wanna address. I wanna talk about the other side of it and how this game should absolutely not be taken seriously at the end of the day. This might sound silly to you, but if you take a look at some of the popular controversy out there, like, I don't know, the Flat Earth Theory? Yeah, makes sense. Look, I know mentioning stuff like this upsets people and all, but all I wanted to say was, don't take anything in the game out of it and anything mentioned before is not my opinion. At the end of the day, this is just a game and games are there to be enjoyed. Alright, enough of that. Let's talk about another strength of this game. The level design. This game's levels are designed in such a way that they are puzzles. What I mean is that when you arrive in a level, you might find it extremely oppressive and kinda difficult to explore. But you push through all of that, preferably through stealth, and explore the level. Once you go around enough, you might come across various elements uh, that might help you get an upper hand over the enemies through indirect means. You could turn off the, one of the cameras that made exploring hard, you could turn on a gas valve to reduce the amount of enemies in a room, or you could turn the robots around to target enemies by hacking a specific terminal, etc. This way of turning the tides of an extremely threatening level is very satisfying to pull off, especially without triggering an alarm. The best part, is, the best part or the worst part is once you overcome certain major obstacles of the level, you would come across another much preferable method of overcoming what you just overcame. And that is exactly why you want to do a second playthrough of this game. For example, take this level in which JC Denton got captured in a prison for a certain mission and has to escape. There is a section in which you can try to infiltrate the armory in order to retrieve your arsenal that has been compromised. On the way there, there is a bit where there are guards on the upper level and on your level. Now, what you won't realize is that there is a third level too that overlooks both the lo lower levels that can only be accessed if you go to the second level. But since there are guards on the second level and less plays to walk around, you won't even see the third floor. So what I did was navigate around the various boxes, the first floor around the one guard there and reach through to the arm. I accessed the armory by hacking the keypad with a multi-tool and ended up fighting the guard in there to trim my stuff. But what you don't realize is that if you go to the third floor, you can't get the armory code as well as turn the robots around the level to attack the guards from a terminal there. Things like this are very satisfying since you find a better solution and get to do it that way. Again, the experimental style heavily contributes to this aspect. The other cool thing the game does is eavesdropping. The game has a tendency to drop additional story related elements, lore elements or gameplay tips through eavesdropping. For example, take this instance of Walton Simons, a government official who is also a cyborg just like JC Denton. Complaining about a pain behind his eye to the field doctor, Amy Reyes. What kind of pain? Behind the eyes, a sharp burning, almost electrical. How's your bioelectric level? It's always at 
I like to stay prepared. That's probably it right there. Free radicals. You should charge your systems only when they've been significantly drained. I wasn't informed of that. It's a lot like an electric razor. If you leave it plugged in all the time, the battery loses its zero point. Just watch your levels. Interesting. Thanks, Doctor. Let me know how... So, so what happened, right? Walton Simons complains about an electric pain behind his eye, to which the doctor asks him about his bioelectric levels. Walton Simons responds that he ke always keeps it 100% charged. The doctor prescribes that he should not always keep it at 100% and that is what is causing the pain. Seems like a normal conversation to have between a cyborg and his doctor, right? Oh, well, that is until you realize this is the game's way of advising the player on a certain game mechanic. Now, should I explain this before? But essentially, bioelectricity is like your mana, but for your augmentations. If you activate one of your augmentations, it will deplete the bioelectricity bar in your HUD. Bioelectricity does not regenerate on its own. You have to recharge it using either the repair bot or by consuming bioelectric cells that can be found around the world. Essentially, this exchange of conversation is advising the player to be more resourceful with their bioelectric cells and use them correctly. This way of filling the player on story beats or tipping the player on gameplay mechanics is very interesting to listen to and very creative but at the same time contributing to the fact that you are an agent and you do cool things like this. And we have been talking about this game and buttering it up for a while now. But, like they say, all good games has their fair share of flaws. So, I want to mention 4 things that I found lacking. But before that, I want to give you a spoiler warning as two of them are story related. So pause the video and skip to the time on screen if you have not played the game yet. Alright, I guess now that I have said that, let's talk about this. First one is about how GC Denton betrays Unatco the whole coalition, specifically on how jarringly this is done. I mean, this complaint depends upon the player's decision I guess, but regardless of that, I still want to mention this. The first time I played the game, I was entirely trustworthy of the coalition and UNATCO. So when JC's brother, Paul Denton, turns to the NSF, I made my JC stand firm and true to UNATCO, just like any honorable agent. So, when all the conversations about JC's views on UNATCO and his standings in the conflict came to the table with other NPCs, I chose all the options that resembled that of someone who was unwavered in his trust and belief to the coalition. But as you all know, the story goes in the way that JC eventually turns against the coalition and sides with the NSF and other parties in the conflict. So. When the story did that, in my case, it was very jarring. I was essentially forced to change my JC even though moments before my JC was acting in strong faith with the coalition. I don't know, maybe other people had this differently at dinner today and this could be a me thing. The second gripe is that of narrative. So essentially I heard that there was this whole plan of having multiple narratives which the player can explore. But then later, this was cut out of the game due to reasons. One such narrative was you being able to side with the coalition if you wanted. This might explain the previous gripe I had with the game, but in this instance, it's more of a I felt let on case. The instance that I'm talking about is when you're in Hell's Kitchen and you help Paul transmit the signal to Silhouette in France since he is injured due to the kill switch being active. Now, credit where credit is due, depending on your choice, you can kill him or save him. But if you choose to kill him by, le by leaving him to UNATCO read, the narrative hints that you can escape capture and go to Hong Kong and join Crazer Tong. While it's true that you essentially end up doing this exact thing later in the game, I wanted to see a major nar narrative deviation. So the first time I tried to escape capture, your pilot Jock tells you that he has to leave immediately from Battery Park as UNATCO troops 
are closing in, but naive me was hopeful that I could still catch up to Jock and take to the subway. There I was confronted by Anne Navarre, who challenges me and into a battle and I promptly died due to my combat skills being low. But I reload the game and push on through vents and make it up to Battery Park. But turns out that is fruitless since there's a bunch of Unatco troops waiting for me at the entrance along with Agent Herman who, ask, who asks me to surrender or die. I chose the latter option to see if I could somehow flee from there. But guess what? The whole place is surrounded by invisible walls. At the end of the day, I sat in my prison cell with one of the more likable characters dead and a disappointed face. Things like these that cover up for cut content from the game are all essentially unpolished just like this and can be disappointing considering one of the game's staple is that of player freedom. Again, might be a me thing, but I have seen other reviewers point this out too. Alright. The next gripe. The next gripe I had with the game are the freaking ladders, man. Look, I am not someone who has high standards for video games. I mean, the Assassin's Creed series was a staple of video games for me at one point in my life. But the one thing that I cannot deal with are ladders before Half-Life 2. And this game, unfortunately, is before Half-Life 2. I mean, while it's not atrocious like Half-Life 1, there are a fair few moments where I would look to the side or down and fall to my death. This is even worse when trying to wait from combat since in your haste, it can be difficult to latch onto them. At least they make me appreciate ladders even more in modern games. The last problem I had with the game are glitches. There are these two spots in the map one in an early level and one at the last level. Essentially, you can see through the map into the deep dark void in these two spots. The first one seems to be a lighting issue, and the second one seems to be a rendering issue. There is also one where the lighting just goes berserk in one of the cutscenes where JC's helicopter takes off. This might be due to my set options or this might be due to the GMDX mod. I don't know. I'm not a video game expert. At the end of the day though, these are all but minor inconveniences in a great game. Now, there's one last thing that I want to bring to your attention. Most people don't know this, but this game has cheats. It has so many cheats and wacky ones too. You can play this game in third person, you can summon a million throwing knives that will pierce anyone who stands in front of you, you can get all the augmentations and skill points you want, etc. It is more like a debug menu than your cheats. So yeah. Have fun and thank me later. Before we end this majestic review, I want to talk about the soundtrack. If you don't know this, the music I use in the background are from the game. So if you have been listening, you can tell how good they are. I mean, this is what greets you at the opening menu. Look, I'm personally tone deaf and all, but the soundtracks this game has makes me question that very statement. I never thought in all my life that was even possible. So people who worked on this soundtrack, I have to say, without your talent, this game would not be what it is now if it weren't for you guys. Well done. Just like the game, the soundtracks are an absolute bop to listen to. My favorite are the Unatco theme that greets you each time you open the game and the one that plays in the Wan Chai market. I found myself jamming to them in the game like a drunk bastard. While I could conclude this review by saying this game was amazing and a masterpiece and ageless and all that, I feel like this 
would be much more fitting to round up everything of this game in a nice little package. Oh, Jesus, Sandra. Oh, Sandra. This is terrible. I just wanted to protect her. You did your best. She just got mixed up with the wrong crowd. Sandra was all I cared about in the whole world. I wish there was something more I could say. I'm sorry, darling.